Hi everyone and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. Well, it seems that we have skipped right over fall and gone into winter. It has been so cold this week and windy on top of that. Um, we had frost and maybe that will boost the fall foliage because that's been pretty much a dud this year. I had to break out my winter coat and knitwear to wear to school several days this week. And I even saw pictures of snow on Instagram in Minnesota and Canada. And I'm definitely not ready for that yet. At school, I'm almost caught up with grading papers, but my classes all had exams this week. So I'll be looking over those this weekend. Um, my department had an open house on Friday for both prospective undergraduate and graduate students. It was a lot of work to plan and prepare for, but it was fun to meet the students and tell them about our programs. So really, I've been mostly doing school stuff for the past couple of weeks, and I've only been able to knit a little bit. Um, still, I've been thinking about holiday gifts and I'm kind of planning some projects to be started in the near future. I did want to show you real quick that I finished a hat this week. It is based on the Angel Hat by Kay Jones, which is a free pattern on Ravelry. And I did make a small change. On the rows where you were supposed to purl, I just knit the round because I just didn't feel like purling that much. But it still created a nice textured ribbed pattern all the way around. I used a US size 6 needle, which is a 4.25 millimeter. This yarn is called Cash Vero by Cascade Yarns. It's worsted weight and it's been discontinued now, sorry. But I got this yarn many years ago when I was in Las Vegas at a conference. And of course I had to go visit all the yarn shops in the area and pick up some souvenir yarn. And this one is so nice and squishy. It is 55% merino, 33% microfiber acrylic, and 12% cashmere. It's really luscious. And I used exactly two balls of it, which is 200 yards total. And I had just enough to do the hat and make the pom-pom. So yeah, this is such a pretty yarn, and I love the, the uh, color. And I think it looks really great with, this, with the hat looks really great with the pom-pom on it. And I'm going to give this hat to one of my nieces for her birthday. So it's going out in the mail shortly. Okay, so on to today's show. I've got a really fun and informative episode planned out for you. First, we're going right into the classroom to find out a little bit about alpaca. And then we're going to set out on a field trip to my friend Kathy's alpaca farm. So let's get right into it. Today in the classroom, our topic is alpaca. And the alpaca is a domesticated relative of camels and llamas. They are native to South America and originated in the high altitudes of the Andes Mountains of Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. 99% of the alpaca population is still found in South America, but small numbers of alpaca have been exported all over the world. Alpacas are fairly small, standing about three feet high at the shoulder and weighing adults weigh between 110 and 180 pounds. They are very social animals who are gentle and curious. The lifespan of an alpaca is about 20 years and females breed for about 12 years. Gestation is around 11 to 12 months and usually results in a single birth. Twins are extremely rare, even more rare than human twins. Baby alpaca are called cria, and they weigh about 15 to 20 pounds at birth. In North America, there are over 150,000 alpaca. They live all across the United States, and the states with the largest number of alpaca are Ohio, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and California. Although alpaca is a single species, there are actually two types or breeds, which are the wakaya and surrey. They are physiologically alike in every respect, with one exception. 
The main difference between the breeds is the length and fineness of their wool-like fleece. Wakayas comprise 80% of the alpaca population in the U.S. and 95% of the alpaca population worldwide. They have a more compact, shorter, denser coat with a fluffy, crimped appearance which grows perpendicular to the skin. It is more like sheep's wool than Surrey fleece is. Surrey alpaca are much more rare, even in their native South America. Their fleece is characterized by long, silky, pencil-thin ringlets that grow parallel to the body and hang loose, giving them kind of a shaggy appearance before shearing. Surrey locks are ideally very tight and distinctive in appearance, and they can be twisted in either a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction. However, the Surrey locks have no waviness or crimp like the Wakaya fibers do. A Surrey fleece has a beautiful luster and is incredibly soft, which is why Surrey fleeces were traditionally reserved for royalty. Alpaca come in over 20 different colors, from white to black, with all shades of browns, grays, silvers, and reds in between. I don't think there is any other animal that you can find in so many natural shades. Alpaca need to be sheared once a year, otherwise their coats become matted and tangled and difficult to remove. Most owners shear in the spring, so the alpaca are cool through the summer months and have developed some regrowth for insulation by the time winter rolls around. Now, people are often afraid of alpaca because they think that alpacas will spit at you. But really, they only spit when they're distressed or feel threatened. Most spitting occurs between alpacas at crowded feeding areas or when they're trying to establish dominance among the herd. They generally don't spit at people unless they've been hurt. So now that you know a little bit of background about alpacas, let's take a trip out to the alpaca farm and talk to my friend Kathy about raising these animals. We will see her herd of about 50 Surrey alpaca, which again are the more rare of the two types. She also has several llamas that live with the alpaca and serve as guard animals. And Kathy will talk a little bit about why llamas are good guard animals and how you can tell the difference between an alpaca and a llama. And let me preface this um, by saying that the day we visited the farm, it was breezy. So you will hear some wind noise in the microphone. I tried to minimize it on both the pre-production and post-production end, but ultimately I wasn't able to remove all of it, so just be aware of that, especially if you're listening with earbuds. All right, so let's head out to the farm. Okay, so I'm here with my friend Kathy, who owns an alpaca farm, and she's uh, going to tell us a little bit about herself and how she got into raising alpaca. Okay, my name's Kathy Albert and I own and manage Heartland Creations Alpacas and I average about 50 Surrey alpacas here on the farm. I started 17 years ago, so I'm one of the old timers and started with one little girl that was less than 24 hours old because that was the investment that I could afford. And since then I've grown into uh, about a 50 animal size herd. That's the size that I can manage on my own and maintain. I know all the animals' idiosyncrasies and um, it's a size that I'm comfortable with. It gives people a lot of friendly faces to see when they come out to visit, but it's not so huge that I lose touch or lose that personal touch with the animals. Now, how much, how much is an animal? I mean, I know it depends on like how good their fiber is and if they've won a lot of awards, but you know, like your first one. My first one I bought for 14,000. Wow, um, that's kind of expensive. It's a lot better than the 20, 25,000 that your average females were selling for at that point in time. Uh -huh. That's when the market was high. Um, I don't want to say it was new, but it was newer at that point in time. The prices are a lot more stable now than what they were. You're looking at probably three to $10,000 for a uh, female now with the way the market is. A lot of times that'll include a free breeding back, so essentially it's a two-in-one package or three-in-one package if the animal's already pregnant. Okay. Um, you can get pet quality animals for a few hundred dollars, and you can go all the way up to, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars for an animal. When I bought my first alpaca, I did border for about three years because that gave me time to put up my fencing and build my barn uh, because none of this was here at that point in time. 
Now, how long does it take you to build this elaborate setup that you have here? This is my work in progress. Um, I was a high school English teacher, and then I spent a decade as a high school principal. So the 18 years I spent in education is actually when I bought my first alpaca. I knew I wanted a farm and farm business of some sort. Uh, but I needed the income to support building that basis, mm -hmm. and so that was my way of accomplishing that. Um, this is 17 years in the works. I still see what's not done, um, <laughs> but I think it's uh, it's grown quite a bit over the years, and I'm very pleased with how things have come together. So alpaca are limited. You can you can't import them into the U.S. anymore. Importation was closed in the 90s. Um, so no, there is no more importation. There's about 150,000 animals in North America. Uh, about 20% of those are Surrey. Uh, so there are enough genetics in North America to keep the gene pool clean and give you enough choices. Uh, but it is a closed market at this point in time. So you got into it when it was still pretty new. Yes, I got yeah. into it in 2000. Um, so it was after the importation closed. Uh, at that point in time, with my veterinarian here, I paid for him to go to a couple of conferences. I bought an alpaca field manual and medical journal because at that point in time, people would say, oh, well, alpacas, what are those? Yeah. In fact, people would say, are those those birds? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> um, but now my veterinarian um, takes care of a lot of alpacas in the area. Most of the universities now and veterinarians know alpacas, and there's places to get the information if you don't have it or don't know something. Yeah, that's kind of interesting that when you first started, the vets wouldn't even know anything about them because they were so rare. And even. one of the veterinarians who's an alpaca guru calls them souped up goats. <laughs> so they are similar in a lot of respects to the goats as far as care and maintenance. What is involved in the care of alpaca? Okay. Um, compared to like other farm animals? Alpacas are much easier keepers, uh, at least as compared to my horses, which I used to have. Taking care of 50 alpacas is about the same amount of work as the four horses that I used to have. They are very clean about themselves. They typically poop in one spot, uh, very much herd mentality, so the actual daily cleanup is much easier. Uh, regular wormings and toenail trims is a requirement with the alpacas. Uh, when I have females that are bred, of course, I do ultrasounds in that. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, there will be a cause for an emergency visit, but that's not, not very often that that happens. When the, when the alpacas are ready to give birth, um, do you have like the baby monitors in the barn? I do have a camera in the barn. There's been many nights that I've spent the night in the barn because I wanted to see what was happening. And alpacas are sneaky um, because your experienced moms will sometimes wait because I have waited and waited for hours on end for a mom to give birth and then I'll decide, okay, I'm going to run up to the post office or something. And, and that's when she decides <laughs> of that course. she's going to give birth. <laughs> Um, about 95% of the time they don't need any assistance, but you wait for a year for a baby and I want to be here when they have them, if at all possible. Yeah, so their gestation period is a, is a 12 months. 11 oh. months, but typically your spring births go closer to 12 and I plan all my animals uh, birthing to be in the spring now. Alpacas oh. don't have a cycle like a lot of species of animals have where they come into heat on a regular basis. It is induced ovulation. So there is some embryo transfer work that's being done now, but there's no artificial insemination with alpacas like there is with other animals. So all of the animals here, when they're part of the breeding program, are stall bred. I keep accurate records and I run them through essentially a man-made cycle. And the females are about 95% accurate in their response as to whether or not they're pregnant. So we behavior check and then after 30 days we can do an ultrasound when we think we have a female that's pregnant. So what brings them into cycle? Just induce ovulation with the male. The male Oh, orgles. just, just yeah. being around the males yeah. puts them into the actual ovulation. Process. Huh. Yeah. That's that's why you don't even keep any males on this side, even right. in another pasture. I uh. want to know what's taking place at what point in time, and I keep accurate records. Right. When I want them to go a different direction. Do you know everybody's name? Oh, yes. They're all DNA registered. And how many do you have? They average about 50. And at one point I had over two dozen that were white. And people would always come in and say, well, how can you tell them apart? But I see them two or three well, times yeah. a day and they're my kids. <laughs> this guy right here is Bellino. This is the llama. And he is the llama, the guard for this pasture. And the llamas average about 200 pounds more weight than what your alpacas are. Okay, so tell everybody how you can, besides the size, how can you tell the you llamas? Impress all your friends 
Um, if a llama is looking straight at you, its ears look like bananas. Good job, Bellino. <laughs> <laughs> and if an alpaca is looking straight at you, its ears are straight. And sometimes from far away, it's hard to see the actual size of an animal. So that's an easy way to tell. So they are, they're, they're definitely bigger. Mm -hmm. And they serve as good guards. I use llamas instead of livestock guardian dogs because they eat the same food. They require the same maintenance. Um, so I'm not adding another routine to the barn and my chores every day. So it works very well. Mm -hmm. a, um, a lot of sheep farmers use uh, llamas for guard animals too. Yes, they do. So what are the alpaca's natural defenses? Do they have, do they, they can run kick, away? but they... the most it's going to do is bruise you. Um, they just don't weigh that much. Right. So if they're in a fight or flight situation, they will typically flight, you know, run, run away. Yeah. So what are the what is the um, advantage of the llamas? The llama would approach something that they see as being dangerous, and they stomp with their front feet. So that's their defense mechanism. Llamas, um, of course, the first thing people think of is the fact that they spit. And yes, they can spit, but in 17 years of having llamas, I have not had a llama spit on me. Um, <laughs> now, if and alpacas misbehaving, you know, they'll turn and discipline that way. And the alpacas actually have a spit, it's more like a spray, um, around the feed tub if they're establishing pecking order or trying to decide who's going to get the best piece of hay. Um, so mostly they spit at each other, yes. not at people. Yes. So there's some little babies up here. That's the little white girl along the fence and the brown girl next to her, that's uh, Kristen and Clover. And then Indy is over by the wood seat. And sometimes. Kristen's the white one? Yes. Does she know her name? Um, to some extent, the alpacas are more like a cat, a little more <laughs> aloof, so they don't come up to you usually when you call them. Uh, Jasmine, the one that you met in the barn that came right up to your camera, she's uh, kind of the exception to the rule. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes if I squat down, though. Now, how old is she, Kristen? Kristen is going on three months. Three months? Mm hmm and the others are four and five months. Their uh, fiber is just, you can just see it from right here. Because mm -hmm. it is very lustrous, and that's one thing that you get with the Surrey alpacas is what we call luster. It makes a very oh, shiny no. fiber. Look who's coming. Mm -hmm. Here, Kristen. Okay, so here we are. And this is Rudy, and Rudy is a Surrey alpaca. All the alpacas that live here are Surreys, which mean that their hair grows down, and actually when they're in full fleece, they look like they have dreadlocks. Therefore, he has long bangs. There are eyes under there. You can't always see them right off. Um, but their hair grows down as opposed to the Wakaya alpacas, where their hair grows out more like a sheep's does. Um, they only have teeth on the bottom, so they're much uh -huh. like a goat in that manner. They are a ruminant. And they are two-toed, so where your hooved animals, like the horses I used to have, would tear up your pastures, uh, the alpacas can go out even right after it has rained, and they do not tear up the ground. They're very easy on the ground. Uh, your adult males average about 150 to 175 pounds. Your adult females are usually 125 to 150 pounds. Um, and the females mature at about a year and a half of age, and the males mature at about three, three and a half years of age. And you have a lot of um, award-winning alpaca from shows, mm -hmm. right? Is he one of them? Um, he is, and actually his sire has won about everything that he can win, both in the show ring and uh, in the fleece arena, because with alpacas you can show the animal, you can show just the fleece and mail that out, or you can uh, enter composite classes, which actually judge the animal and the fleece separately, and then mm -hmm. come up with a total. And so your farm, I noticed, I, I thought maybe uh, people would be interested to know the name of your farm. It's um, Heartland Creations, mm -hmm. but it's spelled kind of funny. It is. So it's where does that come from? <laughs> C-R-I-A-T-I-O-N-S, and it is in quotes because I used to be an English teacher, and I wanted people to know that I spelled it <laughs> intentionally. Um, a Crea is a baby alpaca. Ah, so yeah. And is spelled that way because of that. So they're a parent. <laughs> And he has won about everything he can win, both in the show ring and fleece-wise. You can see he's a very upright, stately male, uh, well-built, good weight on him. He was shorn in May. But you can see this is how much growth he has since uh, late May. And he's been shorn now, gosh, probably three times. 
And so by spring, he'll have six or eight inches of growth. Yeah. Now he's been rolling in the dirt, so you can't see as much luster on him as what we would see, you know, on but the you can I mean, you can just tell how soft that is. But it's, now, what do they do at shows? Do you, is it like a dog show where you walk them around? Mm -hmm. And then... And it's either... <laughs> he wants to be in the show, too. There you go, he does. <laughs> It's either 50% confirmation, 50% fiber, or 40% confirmation, 60% fiber, depending on what show you go to. So they're looking at your fleece quality. They're looking at the body capacity of the animal. With your females, whether or not um, she'd be able to carry a pregnancy through. Mm. And they look for straight legs and good body structure and bone structure. Is this his friend? Are they like best friends? Um, no, he's <laughs> usually jealous. Oh, okay. <laughs> So he wants to make sure he's, this one's not getting any attention that he's not. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely a follower and heir apparent is more the leader. The leader. Is he really? Is heir apparent really kind of the leader of the name. pack? Yeah. Just depends. This is a standard size llama rug that I have processed. And I brought these two because you were taking pictures of Bellino. And Bellino's the white llama, so that's him by himself. Mm -hmm. And then this is Bellino and Rascal. I love their, st just their sturdiness. Mm -hmm. And most of the rugs I have in my house are between 7 and 10 years old. Um, they say to hose them off or spot clean. I put mine in the front load washing machine, which I'm sure is not what you're supposed wow, to do. Wow, but, but still, work. yeah. So they are very durable. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that field trip and seeing the beautiful Surrey alpaca and learning more about them. Now let's talk a little bit about alpaca fiber and working with it in our knitting, crocheting, weaving, and spinning. So the fiber that comes from the woolly coat of the alpaca is considered a luxury fiber that is softer than cashmere and both warmer and lighter weight than sheep's wool. It is several times warmer than sheep's wool because not only do the hairs trap air between them, but the individual hairs themselves are hollow and the air inside the hollow core of each hair adds to the insulating properties and warming effect. Because alpaca fiber is several times warmer than wool, larger garments made out of alpaca tend to be quite warm. A sweater made out of alpaca yarn might even be too warm to wear around the house or the office because of the exceptional insulating properties of alpaca fiber. Alpaca fiber is prized among artisans and crafters. It is comparable to cashmere, angora, and other rare fibers. The fiber, again, is very soft, lightweight, and warm without the prickle of some sheep's wool. 
The first fleece, or baby fleece, is the finest, softest fleece the animal will produce and the most highly valued and expensive. So if you see yarn made out of baby alpaca, it is made from that first shearing of the fleece from a baby alpaca or cria. In commercial yarns, the label usually just says alpaca, but for hand spinning, the two types of alpaca fiber are quite different to work with. Beginning spinners might want to start with wakaya fiber because it is similar to sheep's wool and may be a little more familiar fiber to spin. Um, the staple length might be around three inches. Um, Surrey fibers are longer. Their staple length is usually around six inches from one year of growth. Also, the Surrey fibers lack any crimp and can be very slick to work with. Like sheep's wool, Alpaca is odor resistant and wicks moisture away from the body. But unlike wool, alpaca doesn't contain lanolin, which is that oily coating on raw wool. This makes alpaca fleece easier to clean and there's a lot less work preparing the fleece for spinning. During processing of sheep's wool, the oils are almost always washed out with chemicals or harsh soaps. And this washing process and the lanolin itself can make it unbearable for some people to wear traditional sheep's wool. But a lot of people who think they're allergic to wool might actually be allergic to lanolin and can comfortably wear alpaca without any allergic reaction. Now, even though alpaca is warmer and lighter than wool and it doesn't have any lanolin in it, there are a couple of concerns about working with alpaca yarn that crafters should be aware of if they're considering using alpaca yarn for their projects. The first issue is that alpaca is not very resilient or elastic. Both Surrey and Wakaya fibers lack much resiliency and have a tendency to sag out of shape. Elasticity and bounce in fiber is largely determined by the crimp or the waviness of the individual hairs. And as I mentioned earlier, Surrey alpaca has no crimp at all, so it's really, really has no elasticity. On the other hand, wakaya fiber has some crimp, so it is slightly elastic, but not as much as sheep's wool. When stretched out, an alpaca garment generally won't return back to its original shape, so 100% alpaca yarn might not be the best choice for a fitted garment. One of my friends once made an alpaca hat, and after a few times wearing it, it was all stretched out, and now it doesn't even fit on her head. So for this reason, alpaca fiber is often mixed with wool to give the resulting yarn more memory and spring. And this is why many alpaca yarns are in the lace weight to fingering weight range, suitable for lightweight lacy shawls. Because the lighter the finished object is, the less likely it is to sag. So it's probably not a good idea to knit something fitted like a hat or a sweater with 100% alpaca yarn. If you're interested in making a garment like this, it would work better to use alpaca blended with wool or even a little nylon, but both of which are more elastic fibers that will help the alpaca be more resilient and hold its shape. Now, these are some fingerless mitts that I made out of alpaca yarn probably eight years ago. And as you can see, they're still in nice shape. They're not stretched out or sagging anywhere. And the reason that it has re they have retained their shape is that the yarn was a blend of alpaca and a little bit of wool. So that wool blend boosts the resiliency of the mostly alpaca yarn. Another issue with alpaca that I previously mentioned is that it is so much warmer than wool. You might find that an alpaca sweater keeps you too hot especially if you live in an area that doesn't get very cold weather. On the other hand, alpaca is soft as silk, lustrous, and is very drapey, so it will make beautiful lacy shawls that will keep you warm and cozy. Now, I have several examples of alpaca yarn in my stash that I thought I'd show you. Um, the first one is this one. It's 100% baby alpaca yarn, which means that this yarn was spun from the fleece of a baby alpaca. 
This is Plymouth Yarn Baby Alpaca DK. Um, so I, obviously it's a DK weight. It is super soft and luscious. And I'll shoot a close up of it. And hopefully you can see that fuzzy halo on the yarn that is so typical of alpaca yarn. This next one is luscious as well. It is Cascade Indulgence, which is 70% alpaca and 30% Angora. And this yarn has been discontinued, sorry. But again, you can find lots of different alpaca yarns available at your local yarn shops or online. Now, this is again about a DK weight as well. And this is just exquisite yarn, totally wearable around the neck. Um, and you should definitely be able to see the fuzziness on this because both alpaca and angora will have that telltale halo. So what kind of projects could you make with these yarns? Well, on Ravelry, both of those overlap a lot in terms of what people have made with them. There are a lot of fingerless gloves. I just picked out a few to show you here, but they are all incredibly beautiful. There are also some scarves and cowls that people had made. So that gives you some inspiration. Just be aware that both of these yarns will have a tendency to grow and sag if you make garments with them, because remember that alpaca has very little elasticity on its own. And although this one is blended with angora, angora is not very elastic either. Yes, so I would stick to making smaller, lightweight items with these yarns. Now I also have some blends here that are very nice. This next yarn is Surrey Alpaca, so it actually says it's Surrey, and Nylon from the Alpaca Yarn Company, and it's called Halo. And as you can see, it's aptly named because it has a quite noticeable halo or fuzziness from the alpaca. And in this yarn, it is brushed alpaca, so that brushed finish really brings out the halo. The nice thing is that being blended with nylon will boost the elasticity of this yarn, so you don't have to worry about anything you make with it, stretching out of shape and sagging. Now, this is a lace weight yarn, but because of the sizable halo, it knits up into a denser fabric than you might think on something like a size 5 needle. So I looked this up on Ravelry, and people had made a bunch of different beautiful sweaters with it. These are just exquisite projects. And then there were some hats and scarves that were also made with it. A similar yarn to that one is Plymouth Baby Alpaca Brush, which is 80% baby alpaca and 20% acrylic. So that acrylic, again, will add some elasticity to the alpaca, which will help anything you make with it hold its shape. This is a beautiful worsted weight yarn, again with that brush texture, so it's quite fluffy. And this is so soft and squishy, just luscious for a variety of projects. Now here are some projects that I found on Ravelry. There are several lovely cowls, hats, berets, and even a beautiful cabled afghan. Yes, this would be so warm and cuddly for whatever you wanted to make with it. And this last yarn I picked out to show you is some beautiful sock yarn called Packapeds by the Alpaca Yarn Company. It is 20% alpaca, 65% superwash wool, and 15% nylon. I love this blend because the alpaca will make it super soft and warm, the wool will let whatever you make with it keep its shape, and the nylon will give it strength. So it's a trifecta. Of course, a lot of people are making socks with this yarn. I've seen so many beautiful finished objects on Ravelry, but also people have made shawls, hats, and fingerless mitts, as well as other things. So this is a very versatile yarn that would be excellent for so many different kinds of projects. Now I think I'll end there with the yarn show. 
But the take home message here is to keep in mind the appropriate projects for the type of yarn you have. Hopefully this gave you some ideas of the kinds of alpaca yarns that are available and the kinds of projects you could knit or crochet with them. I hope you've enjoyed this segment that's been all about alpaca and maybe now you can see why this exquisite luxury fiber has been called the modern day golden fleece. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I'm glad you joined me for a look at the history and characteristics of the alpaca as well as what it takes to raise these beautiful and adorable animals. So what are your experiences with alpaca, including interacting with the animals uh, themselves, as well as alpaca fiber for spinning or alpaca yarn? Have you visited an alpaca farm before? And have you used any alpaca yarn in your knitting or other making? And what did you make? And how did it turn out? I'm always interested to hear about your experiences as well as what was new to you or if you learned anything. And if you have any questions for Kathy about alpaca farming or Surrey alpaca or using llamas as guard animals or anything else, please share your questions, thoughts, and reactions in the comment section below. I always read all of your comments and I do try to respond to your remarks as soon as I can. It's always great hearing from you. And as always, please leave a comment if you have any questions about today's show or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see on future episodes or if you'd like to see a product tested. Leave your suggestions in the comment section below. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and I'll see you in the next video. With the holiday season quickly approaching, I think that next week I'll talk about some more gift ideas for knitters. I did a gift idea show a few months ago and a lot of you said that you were really interested in seeing more gift ideas. And I've been collecting some gifts that are unique and not the same old thing that everyone is talking about. So if you're attracted to that kind of gift, you don't wanna miss my next video. Watch for it next week. And in the meantime, stay smart and have a sparkly week. Bye everybody. Mm -hmm.